In Psalm 100 and verse three, the first point I would make very clearly is that God is our creator. Amen. I understand parents contribute DNA. I understand the science, I promise. All right, but God is the one who is the author of our spirits. There's more to your person and mine than the DNA that represents us, than the genetic code which results in our earth suit. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. And God, the creator of heaven and the earth, is the creator of your spirit. Psalm 100, know that the Lord is God, it is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We did a baby dedication last evening. We had over 20 um, new participants in our church. Yay, God. One was late. It was almost time for service to begin, and the families had been gathered on the other end of the campus for a bit. And a mom and dad walked in a bit harried, and they saw me, and they said, where are we supposed to be? Then I said, come go with me. And the little fellow was six months old. And he was so cute. Everybody we walked past grinned and gooed at him and ignored me. <laughs> Did not hurt my feelings. He was better looking. But how you can see a baby and not believe in Almighty God escapes me. <laughs> Genesis 2 7 said, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. You see, it's the Spirit of God within us that separates us from all the rest of creation. We're not just the highest rung on the evolutionary ladder. We're not just the epitome of what's evolved thus far. There is something different about us. We are the image bearers of Almighty God. He put His Spirit within us. It's a fundamental precept of Scripture. Psalm 119, your hands made me and formed me. Give me understanding to learn your commands. Genesis 1, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Again, there's nothing ambiguous about the story of Scripture. I have found that sin and ungodliness and license tries to create ambiguity, confusion. When anytime I hear about widespread confusion, I know that the Spirit of God is it not at work. And it's in those places the church needs clarity. We need to speak with the authority that comes to us through God. It's not of ourselves. This notion of our lives in our mother's wombs being something of which God is conscious and aware and engaged, again, is a significant theme in Scripture. I want to invite you away from the notion that God's not involved in the formation of that life. He very much is. We don't just gain a responsibility as stewards of children when we hear them cry or they speak their first word or they take their first step. Parents understand that with all of the effort that goes into prenatal care. Your choices very much affect that life that you are shepherding. In Psalm 139, in verse 13, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Said God's aware of us long before we utter our first sound. Isaiah 44, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens and who spread out the earth by myself. Or Isaiah 44, 2, this is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, who will help you. Jeremiah 1, 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Jeremiah is complaining that he's too young. God gives Jeremiah a very difficult assignment. The message that God gave to Jeremiah to deliver to his generation is your hearts are dark, the hearts of your, the generations who preceded you. He's talking about their mamas. In the South, that'll get you in a fight. <laughs> He's talking about their parents and their grandparents. He's saying because of their decisions, judgment is coming upon you and there's nothing you can do. Blood will run in the streets and you'll be carried as slaves to Babylon. It's Jeremiah's message. It is his life assignment. 
Now that's not the only prophetic tack we see in scripture. God gave Isaiah other messages. God sent Isaiah to the king to say, even though you're outnumbered by the Assyrians, God said, I will dispel them like a breeze. I'll send them back the way they came. You don't need to fear them. And we like Isaiah's prophecies, want to take them and use them in every circumstance we face. But Jeremiah's words are just as legitimate. In fact, they're far closer to the words that Jesus gave to his generation. Jesus stood on the Mount of Olives in the Gospel of Luke on more than one occasion, and he wept looking at the city of Jerusalem. And he said, your enemies are going to build an embankment against you. And they will destroy this place. They will dash the heads of your babies against the stones of this city. Oftentimes people say Jesus wasn't political because in Acts 1, when the disciples said to Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? He said to them, that's not really any of your business. I believe the reason he answered that way is the question had already been asked and answered. He told them multiple times what the future of Jerusalem was. It was destruction by the Romans. Jeremiah has a very difficult assignment, folks. We should understand we will be the people of God no matter what the outcomes are to the society in which we live. We'll be called to hold up truth and godliness and righteousness and purity no matter what the systems around us are. It should matter to you because there are systems that very aggressively persecute our faith all over the world today. Oh, they're being venerated and celebrated, but those places they're celebrating have annihilated Christianity. Jeremiah, God said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. When you were formed in the womb, Jeremiah, I had a purpose and a plan for your life. I believe it's true for every child. I believe it's true for every child. That's why we speak on their behalf. They can't use their voice yet. We have tolerated wickedness and ungodliness and we have tolerated amongst ourselves. We've been afraid to have this conversation. There is a plan for each life. Again, this is a very, this is not a subtle idea in scripture. It goes far beyond the time of any single session. In Luke chapter one, that's the New Testament for those of you who prefer. An angel said to Zechariah, Zechariah is a priest serving in the temple in Jerusalem. He and his wife are childless and he has an angelic visit. And the angel says, don't be afraid. Your prayer's been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you're to give him the name John. He'll be a joy and a delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth. <clears throat> he'll be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink and he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. God has a plan for a child to be given to Zechariah and Elizabeth before they've conceived. It's a very important point. It wasn't that the baby had arrived and they presented him at the temple and God sent somebody with a message for them. Before conception, God said, you're going to conceive, it'll be a boy. There'll be a unique calling upon his life. Many of the people of Israel, he'll bring back to the Lord their God and he'll go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Thank God they didn't live in a time when something could have been done before he was born. It doesn't stop there. It's not some subtle thing. Luke chapter one, this part you know because of our Christmas narrative. Angels visiting Mary this time. Not in a village close to Jerusalem, in the northern part of Israel, in the hills of Galilee and Nazareth. You'll be with child and give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus. He'll be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. Please don't imagine that the future of those children doesn't emerge until they graduate from high school. You see, we have denigrated parenting. We've reduced it to something, but something that isn't connected to scripture. Jesus said, if you harm one of these little ones, if you do something to impede their spiritual development, he said the best possible future for you, not judgment, the best thing that could happen to you would be to find a big rock, a short rope and deep water. That will be a better day for you than when you see me. In Matthew one, this is Joseph. 
After he'd considered this, divorcing Mary, because she's been found to be with child and he knows he hasn't been involved. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. What is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. God is very aware of what is conceived in Mary. He is, over, he is watching over it. She'll give birth to a son and you'll give him the name Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. See, I think it's important to understand that God is watching over our lives, every aspect of them. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel. You know the drill, hit the bell for notifications. If you want to, leave a comment.